That evening, slightly recovered, Musk and his companions met with another group in Moscow that purported to be selling decommissioned missiles. That encounter turned out to be equally bizarre. The Russian in charge was missing a front tooth, so whenever he spoke loudly, which was often, spit would fly out in Musk's direction. At one point, when Musk started his talk about the need to make humans multiplanetary, the Russian got visibly upset. This rocket was never meant for capitalists to use it for going to Mars on a bullshit mission, he shouted. Who's your chief engineer? Musk allowed that he was. At that point, Control recalls, the Russian spit at them. Did he just spit on us? Musk asked. Yeah, he did, Cantrell answered. I think it's a sign of disrespect. Despite the clown show, Musk and Cantrell decided to return to Russia in early 2002. Ressi didn't come, but Justine did. So did a new member of the team, Mike Griffin, an aerospace engineer who later became the administrator of NASA. This time Musk focused on buying two Dnepr rockets, which were old missiles. The more he negotiated, the higher the price went. He finally thought he had a deal to pay $18 million for two Dnepers. But then they said no, it was $18 million for each. I'm like, dude, that's insane, he says. The Russians then suggested maybe it would be $21 million each. They taunted him, Cantrell recalls. They said, oh, little boy, you don't have the money? It was fortunate that the meetings went badly. It prodded Musk to think bigger. Rather than merely using a second-hand rocket to put a demonstration greenhouse on Mars, he would conceive a venture that was far more audacious, one of the most audacious of our times, privately building rockets that could launch satellites and then humans into orbit and eventually send them to Mars and beyond. I was pretty mad, and when I get mad I try to reframe the problem. First Principles As he stewed about the absurd price the Russians wanted to charge, he employed some first principles thinking, drilling down to the basic physics of the situation and building up from there. This led him to develop what he called an idiot index, which calculated how much more costly a finished product was than the cost of its basic materials. If a product had a high idiot index, its cost could be reduced significantly by devising more efficient manufacturing techniques. Rockets had an extremely high idiot index. Musk began calculating the cost of carbon fiber, metal, fuel, and other materials that went into them. The finished product, using the current manufacturing methods, cost at least 50 times more than that. If humanity was going to get to Mars, the technology of rockets must radically improve. And relying on used rockets, especially old ones from Russia, was not going to push the technology forward. So on the flight home, he pulled out his computer and started making spreadsheets that detailed all of the materials and costs for building a mid-sized rocket. Cantrell and Griffin, sitting in the row behind him, ordered drinks and laughed. What the fuck do you think that idiot savant is doing up there? Griffin asked Cantrell. Musk turned around and gave them an answer. Hey, guys, he said, showing them the spreadsheet, I think we can build this rocket ourselves. When Cantrell looked at the numbers, he said to himself, I'll be damned, that's why he's been borrowing all my books. Then he asked the flight attendant for another drink. SpaceX When Musk decided he wanted to start his own rocket company, his friends did what true friends do in such a situation, they staged an intervention. Whoa, dude, I got screwed by the Russians does not equal create a launch company, Adio Resi told him. Ressi made a highlight reel of dozens of rockets blowing up, and he corralled friends to fly to Los Angeles, where they gathered with Musk to talk him out of it. They made me watch a reel of rockets exploding, because they wanted to convince me that I would lose all my money, Musk says. The arguments about the risk served to strengthen Musk's resolve. He liked risk. If you're trying to convince me this has a high probability of failure, I am already there, he told Ressi. The likeliest outcome is that I will lose all my money. But what's the alternative? That there be no progress in space exploration? We've got to give this a shot, or we're stuck on Earth forever. It was a rather grandiose mandate from heaven assessment of how indispensable he was to the progress of humankind. But like many of Musk's most laughable assertions, it contained a kernel of truth. 
I wanted to hold out hope that humans could be a spacefaring civilization and be out there among the stars, he says. And there was no chance of that unless a new company was started to create revolutionary rockets. Musk's space adventure had begun as a nonprofit endeavor to inspire interest in a mission to Mars, but now he had the combination of motivations that would mark his career. He would do something audacious that was driven by a grand idea. But he also wanted it to be practical and profitable so that it could sustain itself. That meant using the rockets to launch commercial and government satellites. He decided to start with a smaller rocket that would not be too costly. We're going to be doing dumb things, but let's just not do dumb things on a large scale, he told Cantrell. Instead of launching large payloads, as Lockheed and Boeing did, Musk would create a less expensive rocket for the smaller satellites that were being made possible by advances in microprocessors. He focused on one key metric, what it cost to get each pound of payload into orbit. That goal of maximizing boost for the buck would guide his obsession with increasing the thrust of the engines, reducing the mass of the rockets, and making them reusable. Musk tried to recruit the two engineers who had accompanied him to Moscow. But Mike Griffin did not want to move to Los Angeles. He was working for InQtil, a CIA-funded venture firm based in the Washington, D.C. area, and he was looking at a promising future in science policy. Indeed, President George W. Bush appointed him to be NASA Administrator in 2005. Jim Cantrell considered joining, but he asked for a lot of job guarantees that Musk was unwilling to meet. So Musk ended up being, by default, the company's chief engineer. Musk incorporated space exploration technologies in May 2002. At first, he called the company by its initials, SET. A few months later, he highlighted his favorite letter by moving to a more memorable moniker, SpaceX. Its goal, he said in an early presentation, was to launch its first rocket by September 2003 and to send an unmanned mission to Mars by 2010. Thus continued the tradition he had established at PayPal, setting unrealistic timelines that transformed his wild notions from being completely insane to being merely very late. 16 Fathers and Sons Los Angeles, 2002 Errol, Kimball, and Elon Baby Nevada Just as Elon was launching SpaceX in May 2002, Justine gave birth to their first child, a boy, named Nevada because he had been conceived at the annual Burning Man Festival held in that state. When he was 10 weeks old, the whole family went to Laguna Beach, just south of Los Angeles, for a cousin's wedding. During the reception, a manager at the hotel came and looking for the Musks. Something had happened to their baby, he said. When they got back to the room, paramedics were intubating Nevada and giving him oxygen. The nanny explained that he had been sleeping in his crib, on his back, and at some point had stopped breathing. The cause was probably sudden infant death syndrome, an unexplained malady that is the leading cause of infant mortality in developed countries. By the time the paramedics resuscitated him, he had been deprived of oxygen for so long that he was brain dead, Justine later said. Kimball rode to the hospital with Elon, Justine, and the baby. Even though he had been declared brain dead, Nevada was kept on life support for three days. When they finally made the decision to turn off the breathing machine, Elon felt his last heartbeat and Justine held him in her arms and felt his death rattle. Musk sobbed uncontrollably. He cried like a wolf, his mother says. Cried like a wolf. Because Elon said he could not bear returning home, Kimball arranged for them to stay at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. The manager gave them the presidential suite. Elon asked him to get rid of Nevada's clothes and toys, which had been brought to the hotel. It was three weeks before Musk could bear to go home and see what had once been his son's room. Musk processed his grief silently. Navid Farouk, his friend from Queens University, flew to Los Angeles and stayed with him right after he returned home. Justine and I tried to draw him into conversations about what happened, but he did not want to talk about it, Farouk says. Instead, they watched movies and played video games. At one point, after a long silence, Farouk asked, How are you feeling? How are you dealing with it? Musk completely shut down the conversation. I've known him long enough to read his face, Farouk says. 
I could tell he was determined not to talk about it. Justine, on the contrary, was very open about her emotions. He wasn't very comfortable with me expressing my feelings over Nevada's death, she says. He told me I was being emotionally manipulative, wearing my heart on my sleeve. She attributes his emotional repression to the defense mechanisms he developed during childhood. He shuts down emotions when in dark places, she says. I think it's a survival thing with him. Errol arrives. When Nevada was born, Elon invited his father to fly from South Africa to see his grandson. It offered Elon a chance, 13 years after he left South Africa, to reconcile with Errol, or at least to exorcise some demons. Elon was Dad's first son, and maybe he had something to prove to him, Kimball says. Errol brought his new wife, their two young children, and his wife's three children from her previous marriage. Elon paid for all seven tickets. When they arrived in Raleigh, North Carolina, after the first leg of their flight from Johannesburg, Errol was paged by a Delta Airlines representative. We have some bad news, he was told. Your son wants us to tell you that Nevada, your grandson, has died. Elon wanted to make sure the airline representative broke the news because he could not bear to speak the words himself. When Errol got on the phone, Kimball explained the situation and said, Dad, you shouldn't come. He tried to convince him to turn around and fly back to South Africa. Errol refused. No, we're already in the U.S., so we are coming to Los Angeles. Errol remembers being astounded at the size of the penthouse at the Beverly Wilshire, probably the most amazing thing I have ever seen. Elon seemed to be in a trance, but he was also very needy in a complex way. He was uncomfortable having his blustery father see him in such a vulnerable state, but he also did not want him to leave. He ended up urging his father and his new family to stay in Los Angeles. I don't want you to go back, he said. I will buy you a house here. Kimball was appalled. No, 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 this is a bad idea, he told Elon. You're forgetting that he's a dark human. Do not do this, do not do this to yourself. But the harder he tried to talk his brother out of it, the sadder Elon got. Years later, Kimball wrestled with what yearnings were motivating his brother. Watching his own son die, I think that that was what drove him to want his father near him, he told me. Elon bought a house in Malibu for Errol and his brood, along with the biggest land rover he could find, and he arranged for the children to be put into good schools and chauffeured there each day. But things quickly got weird. Elon was getting concerned that Errol, who was then 56, was becoming uncomfortably attentive to one of his stepdaughters, Jana, who was then 15. Elon became furious at his father because of what he perceived as his inappropriate behavior, and he had developed a deep sympathy and tugging sense of kinship for Errol's stepchildren. He knew what they had to live with. So he offered to buy Errol a yacht to be harbored 45 minutes from Malibu. If he agreed to live there on his own, he could see his family on weekends. That was not only a weird idea, but also a bad one. It made the whole situation stranger. Errol's wife, who was 19 years younger than he, began deferring to Elon. She saw Elon now as the provider in her life and not me, Errol says, and so it became a problematic situation. One day when Errol was on the boat, he got a message from Elon. This situation is not working, he said, and he asked Errol to go back to South Africa. Errol did. A few months later, his wife and family moved back as well. I tried threats, rewards, and arguments to change my father for the better, Elon later said. And he must breaks off for a long period of silence. No way, it just got worse. Personal networks are more complex than digital ones. 17 Riving Up SpaceX, 2002 Tom Mueller Tom Mueller As a kid growing up in rural Idaho, Tom Mueller loved playing with model rockets. I made dozens. Of course, they didn't last long because I'd always crash them or blow them up. His hometown of St. Mary's, population 2,500, was a logging village about 100 miles south of the Canadian border. His father worked as a lumberjack. 
As a kid, I was always helping dad work on his log truck, using the welders and other tools, Mueller says. Being hands-on gave me a feel for what would work and what wouldn't. Lanky and sinewy with a dimpled chin and jet black hair, Mueller had the rough-hewn look of a future lumberjack. But inside he was studious like Musk. He immersed himself in the local library devouring science fiction. For a middle school project, he put crickets inside a model rocket and blasted it off from his backyard to see what effect acceleration would have on them. He learned another lesson instead. The parachutes failed, the rocket smashed to earth, and the crickets died. At first, he bought rocket kits through the mail, but then he began making his own from scratch. When he was 14, he converted his father's welding torch into an engine. I injected water into it to see what effect doing that had on its performance, he says. That's kind of a crazy thing, adding water gives you more thrust. The project won him second prize at a regional science fair, which qualified him to go to the international finals in Los Angeles. It was the first time he had been on an airplane. I didn't come close to winning, he says. There were robots and stuff that the other kids' fathers had built. At least I had done my project myself. He worked his way through the University of Idaho by spending summers and weekends as a logger. When he graduated, he moved to Los Angeles to seek work in aerospace. His grades had not been great, but his enthusiasm was infectious, and that helped get him a job at TRW, which built the rocket engine that took Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon. On weekends, he would go to the Mojave Desert to test big homemade rockets with fellow members of the Reaction Research Society, a club of rocket enthusiasts founded in 1943. There he partnered with a fellow member, John Garvey, to build what became the world's most powerful amateur rocket engine, weighing 80 pounds. One Sunday in January 2002, while they were working in a rented warehouse on their amateur engine, Garvey mentioned to Mueller that an internet millionaire named Elon Musk wanted to meet him. When Musk arrived accompanied by Justine, Mueller was shouldering the suspended 80-pound engine as he tried to bolt it to a frame. Musk began peppering him with questions. How much thrust did it have? 13,000 pounds, Mueller answered. Have you ever made anything bigger? Mueller explained that at TRW he had been working on the TR-106, which had 650,000 pounds of thrust. What were its propellant fuels? Musk asked. Mueller finally quit bolting his engine so he could concentrate on Musk's rapid shot questions. Musk asked Mueller whether he could build an engine as big as TRW's TR-106 on his own. Mueller allowed that he had designed the injector and igniter himself, knew the pump system well, and with a team could figure out the rest. How much, Musk asked, would it cost? Mueller replied that TRW was doing it for $12 million. Musk repeated his question. How much would it cost? Oh, my lord, that's a tough one, answered Mueller, who was surprised by how fast the conversation had gotten into specifics. At that point, Justine, who was wearing a full-length leather coat, nudged Musk and said it was time to go. He asked Mueller if they could meet the following Sunday. Mueller was reluctant. It was Super Bowl Sunday, and I had just gotten a widescreen TV and wanted to watch the game with some friends. But he sensed it was futile to resist, so he agreed to have Musk over. We watched like maybe one play, because we were so engaged in talking about building a launch vehicle, Mueller says. Along with a few other engineers there, they sketched plans for what became the first SpaceX rocket. The first stage, they decided, would be propelled by engines using liquid oxygen and kerosene. I know how to make that work easy, Mueller said. Musk suggested hydrogen peroxide for the upper stage, which Mueller thought would be difficult to handle. He countered by suggesting nitrogen tetroxide, which Musk considered too expensive. They ended up agreeing to do liquid oxygen and kerosene on the second stage as well. The football game was forgotten. The rocket was more interesting. Musk offered Mueller the job of head of propulsion in charge of designing the rocket's engines. Mueller, who had been complaining about the risk-averse culture at TRW, consulted with his wife. You'll kick yourself if you don't do this, she told him. Mueller thus became SpaceX's first hire. 
One thing that Mueller insisted on was that Musk put two years' worth of compensation into escrow. He was not an internet millionaire, and he did not want to take the chance of being unpaid if the venture failed. Musk agreed. It did, however, cause him to consider Mueller an employee rather than a co-founder of SpaceX. It was a fight he had regarding PayPal and would have again involving Tesla. If you're unwilling to invest in a company, he felt, you shouldn't qualify as a founder. You cannot ask for two years of salary in escrow and consider yourself a co-founder, he says. There's got to be some combination of inspiration, perspiration, and risk to be a co-founder. Ignition Once Musk was able to enlist Mueller and a few other engineers, he needed a headquarters and factory. We had been meeting in hotel conference rooms, Musk says, so I started driving through the neighborhoods where most of the aerospace companies are, and I found an old warehouse right near the L.A. airport. The SpaceX headquarters and the adjoining Tesla design studio are technically in Hawthorne, a town within Los Angeles County next to the airport, but I will refer to the location as Los Angeles. In laying out the factory, Musk followed his philosophy that the design, engineering, and manufacturing teams would all be clustered together. The people on the assembly line should be able to immediately collar a designer or engineer and say, why the fuck did you make it this way, he explained to Mueller. If your hand is on a stove and it gets hot, you pull it right off, but if it's someone else's hand on the stove, it will take you longer to do something. 